I'm Seth Miller, the Executive Director of the Innocence Project of Florida. I'm embarking on a journey that we're calling Freedom to Walk. Uh, I'll be, for almost six weeks, walking the Camino de Santiago uh, from the French side of the Spanish border all the way to a city called Santiago de Compostela and then on to the end of the earth or the ocean. Um, this walk um, is a historic pilgrimage walk uh, that has religious roots, um, but more recently, people walk for all kinds of reasons, and um, I'm walking because uh, I generously have a sabbatical from the Innocence Project of Florida, and it's an opportunity for me to simplify and reset and kind of clear my head before I come back uh, so I can be recharged and continue the imp with my staff members and my colleagues the important work that we're doing at the Innocence Project of Florida. We wanted to um, use this walk as an opportunity to highlight uh, both the solitude and challenges of wrongful incarceration, but also um, the freedom that those uh, who are free to enjoy to move about where they like, travel and explore in ways that they were never able to do when they were wrongfully convicted and incarcerated. So it's really a, a dual purpose um, to highlight you know, our clients who are still in prison who don't have the freedom to walk, but honor our um, former clients who have been released, who are on their own journeys and explorations uh, in the free world with the time they have left on this earth. We've had tremendous success in helping individuals who are wrongfully convicted be released from wrongful incarceration. Um, I think what a lot of people don't realize is that when someone is released from wrongful incarceration, it's almost as if the real work almost begins right at that point. Um, it's very difficult to reintegrate back into a society that is so different than the one many people left 10 or 20 or 30, even 40 or more years prior. And um, there's a lot of work that goes into making sure that our clients post-release can gain full stability in their lives so they can live happy, healthy, um, and safe lives for however long they have left on Earth. And so in 2007, you know, we realized that it wasn't good enough just to have a social worker. We needed to set aside um, a, a clear fund to provide mon a modicum of support to our clients who've been released so that, again, they can um, enjoy their freedom and be ha happy, healthy, and safe. And that's when we created the Exoner Support Fund. And um, at this point each year, we allocate about $60,000 annually to help our clients with everything from um, education, uh, rent support, uh, transportation support, food support, uh, help with co-pays uh, for, for doctors and, and therapists. Um, we help them with job training and job assistance. We have uh, sent many a client to culinary school or to get their commercial driving license so they can better their job prospects uh, and be able to better support themselves. Um, you know, if a, car, a client's car breaks down suddenly and they can't afford to fix it, but that car is vital to get them to and from their job or to and from their appointments. We'll use uh, funds from the Exoneries Support Fund to uh, help with that so our clients can get back on their feet and get back to the hard work of reintegrating back into society. So one of the things that we thought about uh, when we conceived Freedom to Walk um, was that you know I'm here walking in honor of our clients who are in prison, who aren't free to walk. I'm walking across Spain for our clients who have been freed, who are on their own journey, um, but that we wanted to connect up a fundraising piece for this, uh, for this walk to the Exoneree Support Fund. And we have a goal of raising $15,000 that will be matched dollar for dollar by the Dr. Sarah Pappas Fund for Innocence. And uh, if we're able to meet that goal or exceed that goal, uh, we'll be able to raise uh, half or more of what we need to help our clients annually reintegrate back into society 
through the Exoneree Support Fund. So every dollar that uh, you give towards Freedom to Walk is, uh, is, will be $2 to help our clients get their bus passes, get, um, pay for their really important doctors and therapist appointments, pay for vital job training so they can create greater financial stability. It's a, it's a great opportunity to provide uh, critical funding to the Innocence Project of Florida that goes directly to uh, our clients who need tons of support in order to adequately reintegrate back into the free society. I had the luxury uh, to be able to go on a journey and explore with our client James Bain, who was wrongfully convicted in 1974 and exonerated uh, through DNA testing in 2009 after 35 years of wrongful incarceration. And we were invited to go to Germany, to Munich, um, to do this big variety show about important people um, of 2010. And it was a really neat experience. Uh, and you know, we got to meet people from all over the world who had big moments in 2010. We met the Chilean miners. Uh, we met some other really interesting people, but maybe the most interesting experience for me for the whole trip was to be able to uh, be with James and experience vicariously through him something that he never thought he would experience. And that is, you know, the ability to get on a plane and travel across the ocean um, to visit someplace that is totally different, um, that is a world away. And we had the unique experience together to go to the Dachau concentration camp, um, which, is, which was a Nazi concentration camp uh, that is still preserved outside of Munich. And it was, it was especially unique for me because I'm a grandchild of Holocaust survivors. Uh, um, two of my grandparents were in concentration camps and um, my mother was born in a uh, refugee camp, a displaced persons camp after the war in Germany. And so yeah, I'm a first generation American who is a grandchild of Holocaust, a grandchild of Holocaust survivors. And it, it dawned on me that I'm experiencing this with a person who himself was you know, a victim of wrongful incarceration, much like my family members, albeit um, of a different degree. Um, and you know, James is a student of history. He used to tell me that he would collect newspaper clippings. He called them artifacts uh, while he was in prison. And when he walked out of prison with his one mesh bag of all his stuff, it was filled with those artifacts of those 35 years, um, things that he kept because he felt they were important uh, markers in history. And so f for him to be able to go somewhere and experience something that was a very important marker in history and a devastating you know, time for um, people that had a connection to his own experience it was really important for him, but especially important for me to experience that with him. And so when we t think about the freedom to walk, it, this is the freedom to have a journey that's yours. Uh, and you know, for me, it's going to be an opportunity for me to travel across Spain by foot, uh, over 575 miles, over uh, close to 40 days, um, to meet people from all over the world that are on their own journey, uh, to hopefully learn and speak a lot of Spanish so I can um, use that in my day-to-day -day life. And um, again, just reset uh, and be able to come back recharged and ready for the next stage of uh, the work that we're gonna do at the Innocence Project of Florida. I've been at the Innocence Project of Florida for almost 18 years uh, with my colleagues doing the vital and important work of finding individuals in prison who are wrongfully convicted and helping to free them. And we've had tremendous success. We've helped free 31 individuals who combined have spent 691 years in prison for crimes that they did not commit. And you know, when we get someone out, the, the whole world sees that and they see sort of the pinnacle of our work, the, the ultimate moments that are important in you know, the lives of our clients and their families and important in our lives because they help renew our commitment to the work that we're doing. Um, what people I think don't see sometimes is the most difficult parts of our job. Uh, 
when we've represented someone for many years and gotten to know them and their family and it comes to the point where we don't prevail in their case and we have to sit down with our client and, and they ask us, does this mean I'm going to spend the rest of my life in prison? And it's hard to know what to say uh, to that person who you've grown a close connection with, who you desperately want to help free them from wrongful conviction and incarceration, but it doesn't always pan out. Uh, the justice system is still unjust. It doesn't always mete out the right result, even when we try to uh, rectify a wrongful conviction. And so those moments, those continued victimization of our clients, the tragedies for them and their families, the losses stick to you. And we, we persist, we continue to work, um, but we all need breaks in order to um, kind of just take stock of where we are, to not burn out, to make sure that we can continue in this work. And for me, 18 years, almost 18 years is a long time. You know, five or seven or 10 years is a really long time. And so I'm lucky to work at an organization that recognizes that mental health and um, being able to recommit and rededicate yourself to this work is really important. It's afforded me and uh, other folks that I work with an opportunity to take a sabbatical uh, to be able to reset and recharge and come back to work uh, rejuvenated um, and it was a great opportunity to highlight what I'm going to be doing with Freedom to Walk um, to both raise awareness about uh, you know, mental health of staff members to do this work to raise awareness about the continued plight of our clients who are in prison and um, raise a little bit of money um, in honor of uh, Freedom to Walk to help the next set of clients get out of prison uh, so we can help them renew their lives and reconnect with their families. You know, when people see someone get exonerated and walk out of that courthouse or walk out of that county jail you know, to a plethora of news cameras and, you know, hug and kiss their family members, those are the really sweet moments. And, you know, we often see our clients on TV talking to the news and about what are we going to do? What am I going to do now? Um, I'm going to reconnect with my family. I'm going to take things slow. Um, but when the, the lights of those cameras dim, uh, folks who have been freed from wrongful incarceration, they have to figure out how to press forward um, with the baggage of that wrongful incarceration. And many of our clients went to prison um, with all kinds of difficulties and struggles because of the lives that they um, lived or were beset with before they were wrongfully convicted and wrongfully incarcerated. Um, many of our clients um, you know, went into prison uh, with hopes and dreams and, and of the life that was going to be and that ripped away from them because of the wrongful incarceration. But all of them come out with a trauma from that wrongful incarceration that they have to carry around with them for the rest of their lives and it's hard. It's hard. It's why, as an organization, we have tried real hard to provide our clients uh, a lot of assistance to reintegrate back into society. But it is a constant, everyday struggle uh, to do that, um, and it's a lot of work. And so I think, you know, sometimes when our people see our clients and they're speaking out in public and they say, oh, he is so calm, he is so gentle, um, that might be, uh, uh, you know, who he or she is, um, but it also might be a face that they put on to kind of obscure uh, the everyday struggles that uh, they might have. And uh, it's really difficult, but many of our clients are doing a very good job to try their best to be the best versions of themselves every day, and we're doing our best to help them um, reclaim their lives. Uh, but people should understand that it is difficult. It's very, very difficult. On March 4th of this year, I'll be getting on a plane and flying to Paris, France, uh, and from there I will make my way by train to a small town in southern France on the French side of the Pyrenees Mountains called saint jean pied de port And this is the traditional starting location of one of the ways of the Camino 
to Santiago called the Camino Frances. Um, the Camino de Santiago is a, a series of routes that uh, Catholic pilgrims took you know, the last 1,500 years uh, from different parts of Europe, England, all over continental Europe, even Africa, to get to uh, this little city called uh, Santiago de Compostela that is important um, in the Catholic faith. And so these routes are preserved uh, for people who are going for religious reasons, but also for anyone who's looking for, um, you know, an important uh, journey to kind of find themselves. Uh, and some are short, some are long. I'm walking uh, 500 miles or 790 kilometers from St. Jean Pied-de-Port to uh, Santiago de Compostela, and then an additional uh, 75 miles um, to the ocean to finish my journey before coming home. Um, a, a, you know, a day would look like me getting up and uh, I'll be staying in, in hostels the whole time with other people who are walking. Uh, and I'm going to get up and uh, get moving usually around 6.30 or 7 o'clock uh, and walk about uh, 15 to 18 miles a day, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, all along the way, uh, there are small villages and towns and even bigger cities, some that you, know, you might know of, like Pamplona or Lyon, um, all of which have places to stay, uh, places to eat. And so it's not you know, like hiking, hiking the Appalachian Trail or anything terribly rugged, um, but um, it is a long journey of walking uh, maybe 15 or 16, 17, 18 miles a day, uh, which for me will be over 39 consecutive days. And so um, I've never done anything like this before. Um, I've always wanted to do it. Uh, I first learned about it when my friend Justin Brooks, who it was the director of the California Innocence Project out of San Diego when he walked um, his first Camino uh, when he turned 50. And so um, he inspired me uh, to learn more about it. And it's been a bucket list item for me um, of something that I wanted to do. And the big thing for me, and um, I imagine for many people that have bucket list items, is we often put them off. We don't do them uh, because there's always something else to do, always something getting in the way. And, you know, you can wait and lose the opportunity. You can wait and not be able to do something that's physically demanding. And so I wanted to take this opportunity to do it not only because I know I can do it physically now, but perhaps I might want to reorder my life around walking um, as, as an activity, as a hobby. Um, I might want to do more Caminos. I might want to travel to other places to do uh, more long distance walks that uh, afford me the opportunity to um, see different places and have different opportunities. And so uh, the big thing is why wait? And again, bringing it back to our clients, we want our clients who are released to be able to explore and have a, have a meaningful journey um, post-release for whatever time they have left and not put off the things that they've always wanted to do. And, and so this is sort of emblematic of that. Um, I'm walking for myself, I'm walking to be a better version of myself, but I'm also walking uh, as a symbol of my clients, like hopes and dreams to, to get on the way on their own journey. When I think about the support that we provide to our freed clients um, after their release, you know, I, I think a great example is uh, our freed client, Stephanie Spurgeon, who was freed in 2020 during the pandemic after eight and a half years of wrongful incarceration for a crime she didn't commit. And you know, she's had wonderful triumphs, but also lots of difficulties uh, in reintegrating back into society. Um, she, in some ways, is uh, one of the most fortunate, unfortunate people I know because, I say unfortunate obviously because she was ripped from her family um, when her children were still in high school. Um, it basically ended her marriage uh, when she was sent away for, to prison for a crime she didn't commit and she was fully disconnected from a career and a family. Um, fortunate because um, she was able to be reunited 
with her family, you know, sooner than many other individuals, um, which is really important. Um, in her time since she's gone out, um, she's been had a, had a tremendous tenacity to look for, you know, employment with progressive responsibility. Um, she, you know, started working at a law firm where she has been, um, you know, the, a really vital part of that law firm as a legal assistant. She's going to paralegal school to, um, to, you know, further her education. She has gone to two Innocence Network conferences and made friends with uh, freed people from all over the country that she can, uh, you know, have fellowship with and be an inspiration to. She's gone out and done uh, tons of speaking uh, about her story and connected with people who are interested in wrongful uh, conviction and incarceration and what they can do about it. Um, and a sort of unsaid piece of this is the support that we provided her um, through our Director of Transitional Services, Anthony Scott, to help her um, achieve the mental and emotional growth um, from her wrongful incarceration to be able to get to this point, to be able to achieve the things that she wants to achieve. And when we talk about achievement, it's really special for us at the Innocence Project of Florida because um, when we listed uh, a position for a paralegal because as part of our strategic growth that we're going through right now at the organization to expand our capacity to um, help our clients uh, become free and transition back into society, um, she applied for the job. And we've never had a former client on our staff. It's super interesting, um, but you know, we went through the interview process and she was the best candidate. And you know, we extended her an offer and she accepted it. And on the same day that I'm you know, going on my walk, she'll be starting. So hopefully I'll come back and she'll be all settled uh, six weeks later into the position. But it feels like an important growth also for our organization to have an impacted person on our staff who themselves understands better than any of us what it means to be wrongfully convicted and incarcerated and how that lived experience is gonna be so vital uh, to assisting our clients, both those in and out of prison. So um, we're incredibly excited to um, soon welcome her to our staff and she's gonna be an incredible asset to both the organization as well as our clients. We couldn't be more excited. If you wanna keep track of my progress uh, on Freedom to Walk, the Innocence Project of Florida will be providing periodic updates through email and on our social media channels. And if you want an even more granular um, look into what I'm doing day to day on my almost 40 day walk on the Camino de Santiago, you can visit my personal Instagram, which uh, will have a link in the bio or the caption, depending on what platform you're viewing this on. Uh, so please take a look. And uh, after all, this is a fundraiser to help support the Innocence Project of Florida's uh, Exoneree Support Fund to provide vital assistance to our clients who have been released to help them reintegrate back into society. And again, we have a $15,000 goal, which is gonna be matched uh, dollar for dollar by the Dr. Sarah Pappas uh, Fund for Innocence. Um, and so you can help uh, us meet that goal, help us raise those vital funds uh, by going to the link that's either in the bio or the caption uh, in order to make the uh, necessary contributions to help us with that effort. Uh, all of your support is so vital and we can't thank you enough uh, for everything you've done up to this point for us and everything you will do to help our clients uh, both regain their freedom and to uh, find uh, joy and happiness in that freedom post-release.